Welcome everyone to the Unity Breakfast, the 18th annual Unity Breakfast sponsored by Muskegon Community College. Of course, put together to continue to remind us and forward to thinking of that the youth Martin Luther King around Unity. When I got to thinking about why my business, Alcoa, would sponsor an event like this, I thought, you know, it's pretty easy. The vision of Dr. Martin Luther fits very well with their value of respect about treating every person in our business with dignity, about providing a diverse and inclusive environment for people to work. I think it's bigger than that. Our vision as a company for Alcoa is advancing each generation. I believe very clearly that that's what Dr. King had in mind with his vision of unity. I think that vision also transpired very well to Muskegon County Matter of fact, I've done it before and substituted Muskegon, advancing each generation to see how closely we're aligned with communities across the world. This isn't about people talking about unity once a year. It's about really great, bright people having innovation and ideas and putting together action plans to make those things happen. That's what makes our business great. That's what will make our county great going forward. Our CEO, Klaus Kleinfeld, has been known to say, we stand on the shoulders of giants in terms of those people who have come before us to create paths to make this way easier for us and our part and our responsibility in terms of advancing generations. I think Dr. Martin Luther King is one of those giants. And so we're here today to talk about his memory and to forward his thoughts of unity here in our community. With that, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Gail Nesbury, who's the president of Muskegon Community College and our proud sponsors today. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I was uh, sharing with uh, Brother McCann this week um, to the seat that um, Mark had been here for maybe five years and I have to have him come back. Um, 35 years of being our out community from the camp here with me, that's even very few less than that, but it's very interesting how this community uh, comes together and, and there are people around the room who um, perhaps they did know each other two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, but they know each other now and in, in two years uh, the connection that um, from the camp with me and that uh, I've been able to Remix inside that year was, was wonderful. Um, part, part, of, part of my job is, is getting around, uh, traveling around the country, traveling around the state, seeing um, our, our state legislators, uh, former uh, future state legislators, um, and having conversations about what will move the city floor. And part of that is having a, having a strong um, set of organizations that will bring people together to do more than just um, have a you know, and we're all here having a good time. But when we leave this place, one of the things that we do in the team, and this is unlike other places that I've lived or had um, an opportunity to visit, we actually do things. You know, we get together, we, we move, uh, move the ball forward. Um, every person in this room, every table in this room, I could uh, arguably make a point of, of showing how we're working together to, to make an issue um, become a program or an activity around this community. And from my perspective, that, I, I think, you know, in, in my opinion, that Dr. King was a very, very happy with that, that we look around the room and say, okay, this is not just diversity from the sense of getting together once a week or once a month. This is diversity and inclusion from the perspective of actually getting things done, bringing people together, creating programs, creating policies that make us uh, who we are. Now, before I turn to the room, I'd like to uh, recognize the Board of Trustees. I see most of them here, and I see perhaps one or two um, along the way. So if our trustees of the Stephen Community College, if you could please rise and be recognized by this uh, Stephen audience. Please stand. Thank you, trustees. I'd also like to recognize our, our staff and, um, and all, of, all the sponsors who are involved in this activity. Um, you know, Robert Ward, uh, legendary Robert Ward, uh, 
translator and hold on the person. And our, our, even our jaywalkers, there, there are some guys standing in the hall and singing to us, and I don't know if they're still here, but I promised them um, a free uh, breakfast if they uh, <laughs> come outside of here. They're, they're pretty happy with that, so I'm pretty sure they're somewhere chowing down. So, so, I, so thank you again for being on the I have a lot of people who have the cases. We give thanks to you for this time and opportunity that we have that we might gather in this place. We give thanks to you for the food that has been eaten. We give thanks to you for the life of Martin Luther King. We give thanks to you for the unity that he has drawn from him and his desires, from the words of his mouth that has drawn us together here. We give thanks to you for the unity that will go beyond this time and these moments. We give thanks to you for the fellowship that we will share one with the other as we sit in this place. Many diversity, much diversity, many different uh, thoughts, many different hearts, many different minds, but coming together on one accord, we give thanks to you. On this day, we look up and say thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed uh, guests for today, George and Daryl Flosky, are two of North America's leading authors and historians in the field of ice hockey history. For nearly two decades, these Canadian brothers have been in the forefront of efforts to promote and preserve the early history of North America and international hockey. The Fosseys began their career in 1986 as military historians. In 1996, given their own passion and history as players of hockey, they turned their attention to the sport of hockey, documenting the early worldwide histories of the sport and the cultures that played its many forms. They're authors of eight books which includes Splendid in the Sun, The 5,000 Year History of Hockey and Where Great Men Fall, The Battle of Dieppe, and The Espionage of War Against Hitler. Their latest book, Tribes, an international ho hockey history is scheduled for release in January of this year. And I believe there are novels available today for purchase as well. Their 2004 book, Black Ice, remains the only history ever written of the all-black, all-colored hockey league of the Maritimes. Black Ice is also credited with restoring the history and legacy of the early African-Canadian hockey nearly a century after it had been removed, forgotten, and had disappeared from the Canadian North American historical records. George Fossey is a Canadian historian and documentary filmmaker currently living in New York City. He was born in Prince Rupert, British Columbia, and studied at the University of Hawaii at Hilo and the London City Polytech in England. Daryl Fossey is a Canadian historian and documentary filmmaker as well, currently living in New Beach, Maine. He was born in British Columbia and studied history and journalism at Western Washington University in Washington. When I asked him, you know, why the Black Hockey League, they talked about that it was not necessarily the original area of focus, but it merged the number of gaps in the research and the literature around this very important contribution of African Americans to quite an elite sport. Also when asked, what single finding from their research seemed to have had the most unanticipated positive impact on African American history? They talked about what a privilege it was to debunk myths around African Americans' contribution to such an elite sport. They also spoke of the authenticity being called into question around their work because it challenged popular perceptions of who was entitled to play hockey. Would you join me in welcoming to the podium, 
our esteemed guests for today, Mr. George and Daryl Fosty. Coming up first is Daryl Fosty. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, uh, coming to see the snow again. And we're now getting <laughs> uh, but uh, one thing I want to uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, our new book, Tribes uh, International Hockey History. Ray Rolak is here. He wrote the forward and uh, he came up to Detroit. Uh, Before I run an eight-minute, uh, just an eight-minute eight segment that I worked on with uh, the ESPN uh, about eight years ago, um, I want to mention that what we want to say is about the, the, the there's two schools of thought when it comes to hockey that that it was uh, almost plopped down out of the air in in, in 1875 and given. To a, a bunch of privileged white students in McGill University, and and that, but we come from a belief that it's, it's an evolutionary game, roots dating back to the earliest man, and and that if you put it in that context, just before we go into the color hockey, which, uh, and we'll we'll address this right after the video, uh, that because it's an we believe it's an evolutionary game the, the, the contributions that blacks have made to this game particularly the color hockey league of the maritimes in, in, in the late 1800s to have that context that yes this is a game that is continuing to evolve to this day and and it, that I, I think what gets lost when it when it was taken in the context of that was 1895 or 1875 that it was that it was it popped out of the air. That's easy to dismiss contributions made by others and others of, of different color, color, or race, or, or, or uh, this is this is, not only includes blacks but it includes French Canadian contributions, Irish contributions. Uh, so just keep that in context as, as we go forward uh, uh, and why we feel this history is important, not just as a novelty, but as something that, uh, that, 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 that as, as a way of setting, up, setting the historical record straight, that, that this, uh, to, to acknowledge uh, the, these contributions from the Colored Hockey League, uh, acknowledges not only, it, it broadens the picture of what other other groups have brought to this game. So, uh, I'll pick up the video right now. February, we celebrate Black History Month, in particular the pioneers from Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass to sports figures Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali. Many names are familiar, as are their achievements, but more than a celebration, Black History Month is also about education, a chance to learn about other historic figures whose stories are largely unknown. Jeremy Shapnow on some black athletes frozen out of the history books. not the faces of hockey. Of the four major team sports, hockey is by far the whitest. The conventional wisdom holds that the game was pioneered and codified by ruddy-faced men of French and Scotch-Irish extraction, men who look nothing like these men. But it turns out that the game has never been really white. Not even a hundred years ago. Not anyway, according to historians George and Daryl Fosty. They argue that hockey's roots are black and American. 
a lot of this history was either conveniently ignored, lost, or simply forgotten. The brothers Fossey are the authors of Black Ice, the lost history of the Colored Hockey League of the Maritimes. Their thesis is simple, yet astounding. Hockey as we now know it, the slap shot, athletic goaltending, and skating was introduced not by the white men who generally get the credit, but years earlier in Nova Scotia by the sons and grandsons of American slaves. One of the biggest obstacles we have in revealing this research is the fact that people say, no, that can't be true. We've already credited certain individuals with some of these innovations. You must be wrong. The story begins not in Canada, but here in Jericho, New York, on Long Island. Today, the main made in is a restaurant. In the mid-19th century, it was the home of Abigail Hicks, who would hide runaway slaves in her attic. In fact, the Underground Railroad on Long Island, which ferried slaves to freedom in Canada, was operated out of this nearby church. Runaways came up, and a lot of them, they hid out so they could continue up to Canada, and a lot of them stayed in the community. Drakeford Levi's ancestor, Eliakim Levi, was among those who stayed on Long Island, helping hundreds of other runaways find their way to Canada, mostly to Halifax, the capital of Nova Scotia, the rugged, windswept province 700 miles north and east of Long Island. Eventually, these former slaves would help create the Colored Hockey League. If you look at the history of the CHL, you see that the real legacy of the CHL is that these, this is the Underground Railroad legacy, and that is the legacy that gave us modern hockey. The Fosties say that the Colored Hockey League was organized more than 30 years after the last runaway slaves reached Nova Scotia in about 1895. Initially a church league, the players adhered to a declaration of faith that emphasized sportsmanship and athleticism over brute force. When they found out this league could use the Bible as their rule book for playing hockey, I said, wow, this is profound. Wayne Adams was born and raised in Halifax. His father, grandfather, and great uncle played in the Colored Hockey League. The church did everything in terms of the social status and social development of black people in this province and throughout North America. They saw this as an opportunity to, to move up socially and climb a social ladder and gain equal footing with the larger white community with the ultimate goal being that one day blacks will be equal and sport will be the catalyst to make that occur. In the absence of brawling, the hockey played in the CHL was a lively, offensively creative game. 50 years before Boom Boom Jeffreyon introduced the slap shot to the NHL, the Fosties say it was a staple of the game in the CHL. You see references describing what they called then baseball hockey, which was a slap shot. They didn't have the name for it back then. But one thing or another, they were they were slapping that, that puck down the ice 50 years ahead of everybody else. The Fosties claim that the first goaltender to play not just in an upright position was Henry Franklin of the Dartmouth Jubilees, who stood three foot six. Henry Grayson Franklin was aggressive in goal. The argument's been he, the reason he was the first player to go down on ice was, as some people have sarcastically said, he was already there. <laughs> in its heyday, just after the turn of the 20th century, the CHL was flourishing. From Nova Scotia to nearby New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, games might attract as many as 1,200 fans. Despite drawing from a relatively small portion of the population, black teams sometimes defeated the best of the white teams. Here, for instance, is a story about the Chibuctos, a powerful white team, falling to the all-black Eurekas 9-7 in 1899. Often, when the black teams had a good showing against them, you never had another repeat game. It was almost like, oh my god, we've had the hell scared out of us, we're not going to go back again. Shortly after World War I, the league collapsed, and within a generation, it had all but disappeared from the collective memory of even most black Nova Scotians. The story of the CHL seemed to have been lost. The Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto, how do they recognize these innovations? 
They don't. But when it's built, the Black Hockey and Sports Hall of Fame in Nova Scotia will. Craig Smith is its president. You look at a hockey book and look at a hockey book in the history of Canada. You don't see anybody that looks like me sitting on the ice. You don't see any stories about any black hockey league in Nova Scotia or any contributions by blacks to the league other than Willie O'Ree breaking the column area in 58. 49 years ago, Willie O'Ree became the first black man to play in the National Hockey League. Smith wants to see those who came before O'Ree given their due. The greatest recognition that I think that can be made is for them to say that yes, this league was here, this league stood, withstood the test of time, and this league gave a lot to what we now have in the NHL. What does the game of hockey owe these pioneers? They, they owe them recognition. Uh, they owe them the respect that's been employed for a hundred years. Unfortunately, the proper due and the proper respect that's been due a lot of black athletes in this country has been slow in coming. So now we'll go back and say, no, it's black to revolutionize that sport. That's not going to happen easily. Not without a fight, that's for sure. Jeremy Schaap reporting. Over the NHL All-Star break in Dallas, George and Daryl Fosty presented their findings on the Colored Hockey League to the NHL Diversity Task Force. The NHL listened and is currently in discussion with the Fosties in regards to their research. However, there is still no official recognition of the Colored Hockey League. Absolutely. I'll be uh, putting up some slides in the back as my brother will be speaking. Uh, um, I'll just do the first two here. This is just a, uh, this is an image out of the, uh, uh, the Middle Kingdom period of Egypt of uh, uh, early uh, 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 stick and ball like uh, uh, games. This is ultimately evolved into having a, uh, going from a ring to a to a ball. Uh, it's, uh, associated the, the, the sport uh, originally has been associated with those, uh, either like warrior cult or and and uh, and with uh, the idea of manhood and and and, uh, and uh, death. Uh, so um, as you see in this picture, uh, hit hit the ball to the field of Apis. Uh, uh, the, the Apis is a bull god de deity that's the same bull god deity that you find in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And you have a reference to a game called being called with Pico Miku. Uh, and uh, that would be that would, a thousand years before this image was uh, put on that tomb. <coughs> this is uh, the, the relief that's in the uh, Athens Museum. Uh, what's interesting about this is that you had uh, uh, skates date back to about 3600 BC, and and you had ice skating during the what they call uh, the the, the cultures of the Danube River, River Europe's first great highway uh, during the uh, Belvedere period, which is about 1600 to, to uh, 2000 BC. Uh, what makes this interesting is that you had cultures that were playing field sport and skating. Now, there is obviously no direct proof that well how far back hockey dates, but uh, it is certainly not uh, uh, outside of the realm of possibility that, that these field sports were taken back onto the onto the ice as very possibly as early as uh, 600 BC. But. Uh, uh, I'll uh, turn this over to my brother. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, thank you for the uh, welcome here yesterday. We came in and everyone was so friendly to us that we were nervous for a while. Living in New York, I, I am not used to Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that we were I just instinctively went like this. <laughs> and I thought, okay, here we are. <laughs> but after about a, you know, about a minute, I realized, no, that was sincerity. And I, it took me a while to, uh, yeah, get used to it, right? When you're not used to having people be nice to you, you just don't know what to say. And, uh, but uh, and as historians, because we write the kind of histories that we write, uh, we get more 
a flag that we get praise. And uh, initially, when we wrote some of our works, our first book was on the 5,000 year history of hockey. Uh, we had come out of the military, I uh, worked as a military historian in the first Gulf War period for the US Air Force. I was one of only two uh, non Americans working with the Air Force uh, as a historian or uh, the US government for that time. And I, I had been used to working in structured historical environments, especially with the Air Force, very professional. I, I love working with the uh, military. And uh, I wasn't used to being criticized from other countries. I, I wrote some pretty damning stuff but for the Air Force. We reported on a lot of stuff, but I wasn't used to the attacks that, that uh, I discovered when we released our first first book on the 5,000 year history of hockey, because I realized at that point we, we had entered into a religion. And, uh, and, you know, and they talk about the Taliban and some of these other groups today, and uh, they're nothing. <laughs> the two year old guy that's been to every game in Windsor, Ontario, and, he, and he's up in the stands with his cocoa. Yeah, and I, if you ever played hockey, and I, I did as a kid, I, there is nothing scarier than a woman in some Kmart pants running uh, down the ice at four in the morning hollering, kill him, kill him. <laughs> and I've been there, and I'm still seeing a psychiatrist because when I was 12 years old, I didn't care who that kid was, I just wanted to get off the ice. And the mother was scarier than half the people I ever played against in hockey. And I lost four teeth in hockey, so I, I, you know, I can speak from proof. And, but I, like I said, we were like a two deer in, in the headlights of a car when we, when we released the first hockey book because it was just, the, the, the vitriol was unbelievable. And, and you know, my wife said to me, never, never put a picture of our family on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 you know, at that point, I, I got so scared when I was re re researching books and we were releasing them. When the books would come to our house, we wouldn't have a book. Uh, signings like we have today. Actually, this is a book signing for tribes today, if you want. This is the first, you're the first people to see this book. Uh, we, we wanted to have something special, and we, we, we released this book, and uh, we brought it here today. So this is, uh, uh, Muskegon gets the honor of being the first place to have this book officially. In fact, we didn't even see the book. So, you know, when we were, uh, putting this all together, uh, researching over the years, we got to the point where we just, when we released our books, we just, they just arrived in a strange van in the middle of our suburb, and I would take them in the back, and my wife would come home, and she said, what did you do today? <laughs> and uh, we wouldn't even tell her what was in the book, uh, we just let her read about it. But we came in, in 1996, we were working as military historians, so my brother was actually working at uh, Microsoft at the time, and I, I had... I was working in, and we were working in World War II history on the Battle of Vietnam, France. We were trying to write a book on the history. We had gone into uh, Vancouver in 1986 in Langley, BC, to interview veterans of the South Saskatchewan Regiment. And we get the story of these uh, these gentlemen who had fought in the Battle of Vietnam, 1942, a commando raid that had turned into a slaughter of Allied troops. And uh, then they had later were part of the D Day landings. They fought through the battle, uh, through Holland and the Battle of Shell. We went into their looking uh, to get the story of Vietnam. We had read everything we could on, on the battle and, and we just wanted, we thought we knew the history. We showed up there and we discovered to our horror that the stories that the veterans told us differed from the official accounts. And at that point we realized that history, a lot of the official versions of history were sanitized, that, that uh, they were put in there to gloss over the truth. And we, and we had a, a real problem here. Do we take the accounts of the veterans and tell their story that differs from uh, the official records or do we try to prove, their, uh, you know, dismiss them and go with the official records? And we, we thought about this for a while and we thought, you know what, the guys that were there know the story. The historians sitting in the back rooms 20 years later writing the quote official histories, they met most of those guys have never even been on a battlefield or never been in those war games or, or war uh, politics rooms or some of the other aspects of uh, military life. So let's go with the veterans, we'll go from that. We knew we'd be attacked for our research because of that, because we, we decided uh, that uh, truth, uh, you know, we were seeking truth. And as you know, a lot of people don't like truth. They don't like myth. They, they prefer myth over truth. They prefer lies over truth because truth, you know, it's sometimes it's ugly, sometimes it's, it's hard to appreciate, and sometimes it's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, makes people uncomfortable. And uh, but you know, you can't hide from truth, you can bury truth, you can ignore truth, you can forget about truth, you can actually claim it doesn't exist, and we see that today in our society. A lot of people are our deniers of the past, the truth, or, or facts, and yet uh, truth lives on. And so we said, well, 
when we wrote uh, our first history, the 5,000 year history, we looked at 48 cultures, 13 different languages across five different continents, and we saw a pattern. We saw a migration pattern. We saw the fact that uh, hockey could was uh, was part of the migration of man. It had it had started as a celebration of, of religion. The, the, the shaft or the tree, or the stick was actually the tree of life in ancient uh, Samaria. The symbol of the tree of life. The ring was the serpent with, uh, with its uh, uh, wrapped around the egg of the earth. The, the, the Sumerians 2,500 years ago, or 5,000 years ago, actually knew the earth was round, and they celebrated it. And uh, those was information we had lost. And when we go from the ancient Sumerians across to uh, the Egyptians, uh, who uh, created the ball, and you know, I'm a firm believer that the greatest invention in the world, uh, and I borrow this from another historian, is the ball. Because, you know, nothing has given us more joy, more passion, more hatred, more tribes, more culture, more interaction than sport, and specifically the ball, baseball, soccer ball, football. And it goes back all the way, uh, back, like I said, to the early man. But when you go in, when you see the transition from Egypt, you go across into uh, Greece, 500 BC, you see that as early as 450 BC, uh, there was some evidence that they were skating uh, with bone skates and playing some type of uh, hockey image or hockey uh, uh, game of that image that Daryl showed you earlier of that, uh, uh, that Athens uh, uh, you know, statuette uh, the, uh, as early as 450 BC in, in Macedonia. And that to me is amazing because we do not equate, equate sports with ancient man. But uh, the Greeks were a high society. They were the, the you know, the, uh, the peak of, uh, of, uh, of the human uh, development up to, you know, you could say up to uh, modern times because, uh, like I said, lost, a lot of that culture was lost over time. And we actually went into dark ages and periods where we actually regressed as, uh, as humans in society. And uh, only in the last uh, five, 600 years have we actually reclaimed some of that uh, previous uh, history and knowledge and, uh, and growth. But when you get beyond the Greeks, you see that uh, the Romans picked up the game. They called it Kambuka. And they took that game into England. They, and around uh, 150 BC, we see, uh, we see actually bone skates and uh, images of uh, Romans playing. Uh, uh, the Celts actually had images of, uh, of Romans and others playing uh, uh, what looks to us like hockey again. And uh, the English are, were tremendous at, uh, at uh, Curly and uh, Bandy is what they call the games. And they, they developed traditions that go back in Ireland, that go back 2,000 years, or in Scotland, on the British Isles. But again, it dates to the Romans, it dates uh, to some of this early history. You get up into uh, the 1500s and you've got the, uh, the Dutch, the inventors of the steel, steel skate. And the Dutch used the skate not just for recreation, but they used it as a weapon of war. There's, during their uh, uh, wars uh, in the 1500s, they actually, uh, their, their troops and that used skates to get around and tell maneuver uh, against invading forces, primarily the Spanish and others. And uh, it's a piece of history that we forget. But when the Dutch, uh, in, in about 1570, when they left, Holland, a number of uh, Dutch merchants were forced out of Holland due to uh, uh, military campaigns and uh, wars that were going on in Europe. They ended up uh, in East Anglia or uh, in Eastern England. And they ended up uh, in areas that were going through what we call today a mini ice age, where there was three or four months a year where we able, you were able to ski on the ponds and on the rivers of uh, England, uh, areas of Kent, uh, up in Kent and Norfolk and Kingsland. And uh, you start to see hockey traditions emerging in England around the 1600s, uh, where they're skating on steel skates and they got curly sticks. And uh, we were fascinated by that because uh, you see, you start to see the first rules of hockey struts, uh, the pastime of the English people, 1802, and Boy's Own Book, uh, 1810, uh, Book of Games, uh, where they actually talk about the rules of hockey. And they actually even mention the word hockey in some of the texts. So the myth that uh, Canadians invented hockey, and I say this as a Canadian historian, is wrong because we know that the English gave us the rules. We see them in these early English texts from the 1800s. We also know the Dutch gave us the skates. And we also know as early as 1749 in Canada, when the British came across, the British journals, 
uh, diaries out of Halifax, they discovered, to their amazement, Micmac Indians playing a form of ancient hockey on the ponds around Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Lake Benook, as it was called. The, uh, the region uh, is significant because the Micmacs were the inventors of the hockey stick. We play with a Micmac style hockey stick today. Now, a lot of people don't like to acknowledge the fact that Native Indians had a role in the evolution of hockey, but they gave us the ho modern hockey stick. We don't play with English bandy sticks, we play with the Micmac sticks. Also, when the, uh, I throw this in, the uh, American roller hockey period of the 1880s, 1890s, they used nets. They were the first to use nets along the east coast of the United States. Uh, School like Harvard, Brown University, and others, they had roller hockey leagues, and they used nets, and they had goalies with goalie masks. They used a hard ball, and they're going, we've got an image in our book, Try, of uh, an American hockey team, roller hockey team from Harvard, with uh, a baseball mask from 1900. Now, that's that's 50 years before Jacques Vaughn, 30 years before Kurt Demidick. And, uh, and it, like I said, predates the, the claims in some hockey circles that, uh, you know, the goalie mask is, again, a Canadian invention. And, and we were saying, you know, it's one thing to uh, uh, <coughs> claim something that's false. It's another thing to deny the facts. And we've said, you know, we've often said Canadians didn't invent hockey. Uh, the converse is true. Hockey invented Canadians. <laughs> and and the, the people who upset with us over that uh, don't really understand Canadian history because you got to look at Canadians. Uh, we, when I grew up uh, as, a, as a child in Canada, my family, our family, the roots date back to 1604 Canada, we were French people. Uh, we were uh, part of the old families of Quebec, of Quebec, uh, the Dumas, the Cormiers. We knew when we were in school that there was two histories. There was the history that they told us, and then there was the history we learned when we went home. And my French Acadian grandmother would say to us, well, what did you learn today? And I'd tell her, and she said, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> she said, let me tell you the French Canadian view of the world. And, and I thought, and I was, you know, I loved my grandmother, so I'd show up at school the next day, and I would get into debate with my you know, history professor or teacher in my elementary and high school, and they would just come back and get in class and swat. And don't you ever say that again in class, right? And I was kind of emotional uh, uh, going through high school. I hated my, my history teachers, and I had read everything I could on the history, and I knew that there was there were two ways to interpret the earth and the world in, in Canadian history. And uh, I always felt that uh, Canadians, uh, we were always celebrating the wrong elements of our history. But I also, we, we, because of, uh, as a tribute to our grandmother, we put it in one of our books, Splendid as the Sun, that uh, French Canadians uh, were brought in Canada at the, you know, uh, at the point of the gun, or the barrel of the, uh, or a bayonet after the Battle of Prince Abraham, just to, so, so that everyone could understand the, the unique uh, role of uh, French Canadians in their history in Canada. But uh, again, it was a tribute to our parents and our grandparents so that they could understand that we actually did learn something at the dinner table back then. And uh, if people don't agree with that, well, that's fine, but that's the way uh, some people believe uh, you know, our history is. But when you look at the history of hockey, one of the things that always bothered us was uh, the short changing of groups like the Micmac, the short change of the French Canadian hockey traditions. We don't have records today documenting the history of French Canadian hockey from the 1800s. We have the history of the Montreal Canadiens going back from 1910 on up, but we don't have that early history of the 1800s. We, we got uh, English uh, elites from McGill University and their claims to the origins of the hockey, but we, again, we don't have the, the French Canadian elites. We don't have uh, the Irish histories of hockey in North America in the 1800s. We found, we incorporated some of that in our work but uh, the Irish coming after the potato family came over, they played on the streets of Brooklyn hockey. There's newspaper accounts in the New York uh, papers of these Irish kids playing and uh, creating havoc on the streets and how they set up leagues for them and stuff over Central Park and uh, rate, uh, you know rental of skates and sticks for them and things like that. And all that history has been missed, taken out because it didn't fit into the timeline of people who claimed at the origins. We also know that, uh, again, in Native Indian history, it's been shortchanged. The history of the Chinese, Chinese, we've got photo evidence of Chinese kids playing hockey as early as 1907. We don't see that in history books. 
the Japanese had a hockey uh, league and teams on the West Coast going back to the early, in some cases, of, they possibly as early as 1910, 1911. That's how he, the Asahi hockey team on, uh, out of New Westminster. Uh, one of the uh, one of the great teams of Western Canadian hockey history. Again, they they've been shortchanged in the historical record. So when you when you look at that, it doesn't surprise you that when we look at black hockey traditions, that the 200 hi year history of black hockey doesn't appear because if you know it's just a given. If they're going to keep Irish history out of our historical records and keep French Canadian history out of our historical records, then why not keep the black history out? Because after all, you know. That would be, if you look at the scale of selection based on the Victorian mindsets of the 1800s, early 19th century, the Edwardian period, uh, you, they would work uh, They work on the premise that English history was at the top and everyone below fell into a, a genetic uh, uh, base based on importance. And uh, you work your way down that and you discover that uh, you know, some of these so-called subjected or subjugated peoples uh, their history was totally shortchanged. And when we discovered the history of colored hockey, we were looking at 48 cultures. We weren't thinking that it, that it was a black league. We weren't thinking that this was a unique league. We were looking at this as culture number 49. And we found three references. We looked at 6,000 sources in 13 countries. We found three references to this league. Then we found a photo in 1997. And I remember saying to my brother, you know, I just found a photo of a black hockey team. And uh, we, we contacted some historians in North America and they said, oh, it's a vaudeville act. And I said, we can't, they can't skate. <laughs> and I said, but I kept looking at this picture. And I thought, well, this is crazy. You know, this photo doesn't make any sense. And there's one of the folk images up there. Uh, I said, you know, they look like a hockey team. It doesn't look like a vaudeville act. I don't see uh, anything that would imply that's a vaudeville act. So we just said, I said to Daryl, maybe we can write a chapter on this this black uh, this black story. Uh, you know, at this point, we didn't even know anything about it. So we put the information back there. For two years, we kept finding little bits of information. Then we came across a book called uh, The Islanders, uh, Black Islanders, written by Jim Hornby. He was a historian out of Canada. He wrote a book in the uh, late 70s where he talked about a hockey team that had played, an uh, all-black hockey team that had played in 1900, so uh, as part of the colored hockey league. Well, we phoned up a bunch of historians. We had a picture number two. We phoned a bunch of historians again, hey, let's try this again. What do you know about the colored hockey league? What do you know about this? And again, we got the same responses. Yeah, they existed. We, some of the historians actually said, yeah, we've seen some stuff on these guys. They've existed, but they weren't serious. But at that point, we can think, okay. So in, in the year 2000, we this was three years before we wrote our five, uh, published our 5,000 history. In the year 2000, we went into Nova Scotia with a film crew, uh, five of us, went in there, and we started nosing around. And we went to the archives. We found 165 newspaper accounts written by white uh, uh, Acadian recorder newspapers. This was a Bible. New own, uh, or a religious owned newspaper, or a group of a religious individuals to own this newspaper, they had sent white writers, the reporters, to the game to record 165 game accounts of this league. We came up with that and we realized, you know, there's hockey leagues today in North America that have dreamed to have 165 newspaper articles. Here. And here was a, and here was a, uh, a black team or league dating from 1894 to 19, we think about 1932, 1933 period, that uh, had 165 story accounts. Some of them were just brief little lines. We know the team, they made the score, stuff like that. But uh, some of the other accounts were quite detailed. We found out individuals and stuff like that. And then uh, we also uh, discovered there was other photos. We found a total of six images of teams from this period. So we started piecing it together. We we, we came across some very interesting history because we started to recognize faces in some of the pictures. One in particular, I don't know if Daryl can show us that, go back to uh, the picture of the Halifax Eurekas. The gentleman by right in there, right in the center, the gentleman right there, he's pointing it to it on the thing. That's James Alexander Ross King. 
James Alexander Ross Kenny, we knew him because in the course of doing our research, we found out he ran the school for colored children. He was the guy that found the school next to So we had a name. Not only did we have six images and, and some accounts, we had the name of a guy from 1900. And from him, we started to do a branch up. And we thought, well, Alexander Ross, that's an interesting name. Who is Alexander Ross? Must be his art, uh, his uncle or his grandfather or his father. So we went out looking for Alexander Ross Kinney in the uh, you know census records of Nova Scotia, and we couldn't find it. We found his father. His father had been a barber in Yarmouth and, and had died in uh, in a fire with his uncle and his mother, uh, who had been widowed. She worked as a hamstress. In, uh, in Halifax, and she raised him. And at the age of 14, uh, James Alexander Ross Kinney had become quite a uh, religious man, or a religious boy. He was often, uh, he would often speak at the Carlos Baptist Church. He'd get up there and, and do sermons. And, uh, and we thought this guy was fascinating because he also was born with a peg leg, the sign of the devil back then. And uh, so this guy, we were attracted to him, and we couldn't figure out who Alexander Ross was. Well, I started to research Booker T. Washington in the history of emancipation and the history of the Underground Railroad. And with Darrell, we, we came across the Ohio branch of the Underground Railroad that stood from Louisiana north to Ohio and through here and into Michigan into Detroit and onto Toronto. And the guy that ran that Underground Railroad network was called, his name was Alexander Ross. He was a white emancipator out of Toronto, a lawyer. He wrote his, bio, uh, his biography in 1993. And he, uh, that network had 500 uh, free blacks, uh, British Empire loyalists, men who had served, uh, our families who had served with the uh, British military during the American Revolution. These guys ended up in Canada as free, uh, free blacks. And they had settled in Ontario and other places. They had gone in there. They had 500 of these guys that went back to the United States and they ran this network of, of uh, Underground Railroad Network from Louisiana and going north. And, and the most famous person of that network today is called Harriet Tubman. She was a lieutenant back then. We, don't, we remember Harriet. We don't remember the four, five, uh, 499 others from uh, southern Ontario and Quebec and the you Maritimes know, who were part of that network. And we don't remember Alexander Ross. Alexander Ross was an amazing guy. And we could tell, and we knew from looking at the old records of the Maritimes, the old black loyalist records of the family, we were able to trace the family back to uh, the American Revolution. Some of these guys had served in the Black Ethiopian Regiment, their families, they had fought uh, from the Carolinas north to, the, to New York. So they had been on Governor's Island, uh, the remains of their unit, and they were evacuated uh, at the fall of uh, New York by the British 15 ships went north into Canada carrying black slave runaways. And, and uh, men and their families of the Ethiopian Regiment. And we knew who those people were because they had a, a, the English, because uh, George Washington and others were demanding uh, the return of their slaves. The English documented every one of the, the slaves and the families of who, quote, owned them. And we called that the Book of Negroes. So we knew the family histories of all of these families that went north into Canada. So we had 200 years of family history. We also had hockey traditions going back into the early 1800s. As early as 1815, we were able to document of uh, uh, black hockey on the on the northwest arm of the Halifax of uh, kids playing hockey in communities that were all black at that time, and we know that from British military records as well. So we have this amazing history, but we also knew that Kinney was an outlier in the community. He was never fully accepted. He was never fully accepted because he came out of Ontario. He was part of the Underground Railroad family of blacks that had came up through the Ohio Valley into uh, Chatham, Ontario, and. and St. Catharines, and then the family eventually ended up in Yarmouth, as a, like I said, as a barber, and then they ended up in uh, Halifax. So that there was a, you know, if you've ever been up into Nova Scotia, you'll discover that uh, the black culture is fractured up there. And there's, uh, there's a certain cultural, uh, there's certain cultural classes in uh, the black culture in, in Nova Scotia. There's the black loyalist uh, court, who know their roots go back to the, uh, to, uh, the American Revolution, and they, they're quite proud of the fact that they fought for the freedom that was never given to them. They paid in blood uh, to be free. And, and then there's the Maroons, uh, a group of 550 uh, Jamaican blacks who were uh, who had fought against the uh, 
uh, British uh, in Jamaica, and they were as part of the agreement. Virtually, they wanted to the hell out of Jamaica. Uh, they uh, said, "We'll give you a bunch of land in Canada. You guys go north." And so they went north in the early 18 or late 18 or 1790s, early 1800s, and they. <coughs> this, uh, Halifax, civil, civil. So you have these two unique militaristic groups up in Canada. Those were the founders of, uh, of the black community up there. Then you had the runaway slaves that came in later. So you have three distinct societies in Nova Scotia. And this is something as white historians we were not expecting. We didn't understand that. Uh, and quite honestly, it was uh, a lot of history. I think we really documented that. But when we understood that, we were able to get a sense of the hockey leagues that existed. Now, the Colored Hockey League was formed in 1894 in uh, Dartmouth and Halifax, Nova Scotia, and the attempt was to uh, try to get uh, young blacks to go into the churches in the middle of winter. The, in the, the gentleman by the name of Reverend Borden, uh, wait one second, I don't want to go too fast, sorry about that. So this gentleman right here, Reverend Charles Borden, he, he ran this Dartmouth uh, church, uh, and he noticed that only old people were showing up in the churches in the middle of winter. And if you've ever been in Halifax, let me know why. I mean, it's cold out here today. It ain't as late in the winter, right? Yeah, and that's still the case, I guess, today. So, so he said, man, I got a problem here. I can't, the old people can't get through the snow banks with those blankets. Right? And he looked around and he saw the black guys, the Nick Indians, and others playing hockey on Lake Benoit. And he said, now let's do something. Let's start it. Let's set up a, an after church hockey game. So he went and contacted Cornwall Street Baptist Church and some other uh, churches in the neighborhood and over in Hammond Plains and some of these other things. And said, hey guys, come on in. Let's at the end of the day, we'll get together. We'll have this, we'll have a four hour Baptist service. And when our knees are all weak from standing. And I've been to, you know, I, I, grew, I grew up Catholic and I, I went to a Baptist church. And I tell you, I was great for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, let's go in and, uh, you know, praise God, cast that uh, little uh, piece of bread and uh, give, uh, give the priest a couple bucks just get the hell out of town. <laughs> and uh, you have to sins for six days and then you go in and be forgiven. And I showed up at a Baptist church and they looked at me and they said, it was Chuck Max well, hockey player ran it over turtle when we showed up in two. We, we sit up there and he says to me, you believe in God? I go, yes. <laughs> I'm just checking. He said, can you let me test it? So I got into, I come into this historic it's kind of funeral, kind of strange. They're looking at me as uh, two white guys coming into a Baptist, uh, Black Baptist church in 2000. And, was down there and it starts and we're thinking, oh, okay, 30 minutes or we're doing it. Well, after an hour, come look at it. After two hours, it gets a little hot in here. And I, I've read past the Bible and I understand the book of Habakkuk, and the old ye among the heathen, and the garden one and marvelous. I will work a word in your day which we won't believe, but hey, you could be just four hours listening to us. And after four hours, I was just like, I was shaking. But I understood, I understood what it was like for these guys to get up and go and listen to that. Especially if you're a hockey player, I'm sorry, if you're just sitting there on a sheet of ice and you got your skates in the middle of winter, you got two choices. Do you want to play a game with your buddies or do you go in there and listen to that? Well, he this uh, Reverend Morty was a genius. He said, I hate it. You guys, you young guys, get those wagons ready. We'll have a hockey game. So all of the guys were coming in for the hockey games. And the next thing you know, within a year, they had a hockey league, color hockey league. They showed up and they started, it's kind of interesting. They got in there into the arenas in Halifax. Prior to that, it was only the, the whites uh, playing in the arenas. And they, and they were actually pretty good. These guys could play hockey. And soon they were averaging the average uh, hockey uh, Game attracted between uh, two to three hundred people. Uh, it was a uh, white hockey game that time. They were tracking uh, so above four hundred on, on average, uh, even more. It was apparent that, that people loved the game and they were showing up there. And by 1898, they had a, a league with the best hockey, black hockey talent in the Maritimes playing in the league. Guys like uh, Kenby, uh, you know, uh, Franklin, uh, the three foot six goal. And uh, some of the legends say guys like him, they used to catch the puck in their teeth. Now, if you're looking at what they you know what it is? They caught, I, 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 I believe that, but they only caught it once because that's what it is. 
so I don't think it's a lot. I just don't think they do it very often. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, and, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I, I grew up in the age of Bobby Clark, so I know that. You know, we all catch the puck sooner or later in our teeth, but not, uh, not too often. And uh, so this, this league, it was an amazing league, but they put this 14-year-old kid, who by then was about 18 years old, uh, James Alexander, Ross Kinney, they put him in there to run the league. Now he was, uh, he was, he had backing. He had uh, the White Baptist churches behind him. He had uh, some politicians who were Acadian uh, university professors and others, again, emancipators. He also had the black community behind him. And, he had, and, and this guy was a genius. But this guy was also a Booker T. Washington, uh, you know, uh, I guess you call it the site. He read everything he could about Booker T. Washington. And when I was uh, with my brother studying uh, the CHL, we, we keyed on a, a couple facts about Kenny, uh, Booker T. So we went out and we started looking at Booker T. Washington books. And one book uh, we picked up was called The Negro of the New Century, before the New Century, written in 1900 by Booker T. And I started reading that book, and I was amazed by that because I started to see a pattern in the books. Uh, every six months, uh, Booker T. Would, would make a list in his books of what a black man should do to be successful in white America. And he, would, he was very specific. And every six months, I would see implementation and a historical record of some of these Booker T proposals or ideas. And it was apparent to us that, uh, you know, James Alexander Ross Kinney, he would get a Booker T Washington book and read it. And it took him about six months to get the book and read it. And then he'd go and implement this. And so we could see a pattern where the CHL was actually emulating the, the theories of Booker T. Washington in the early 1900s and the idea of the Tuskegee Institute. And that they were actually trying to build their own Tuskegee up in Canada. A home for colored children was eventually built. That was the basic, that was their goal. But they, they were trying to uplift the blacks and they were trying to bring this league into the forefront. Uh, this league had incredible talent. Uh, we know that they were up to Prince Edward Island and, and to Nova Scotia. And we also knew there was some black hockey traditions in places like New Brunswick, guys like uh, the uh, Willie O'Reilly family playing out of uh, uh, Moncton and, and Frederick in New Brunswick and things like that. We know those traditions existed. So we could see that there was an effort among the black community to uplift uh, through hockey and through the teachings of Booker T and to uplift this league and others. Uh, the problem with this league is by 1905, this league starts to upset a few people. They're attracting up to 1,200 people to a game. They're making money. They're paying their players. This is actually becoming a professional league. Okay. And the guys are charging 25 cents to get into the game. They're uh, the groups like the Eurekas and others. These guys are, uh, are becoming a middle class. They're also uh, starting to get political. They start to uh, promote uh, to, uh, at uh, political rallies for the conservatives back then and others. And, uh, and they start to uh, make demands, you know, uh, and, uh, and that doesn't go over well with the businessmen and, and other hockey circles, doesn't go well with the, uh, with the elites that Ryan Halifax and, and by 1905, 1906, they start to come down on these guys. And they come down on these guys for two reasons. First, they're a threat to the promotion of hockey, and they're, they're squeezing out the Nova Scotia leagues. But they're also, some of the black families are living on lands that the railroad wants. Continental Railroad ran through, but was going through Nova Scotia, and, and they wanted the lands. And these families have that money, they start fighting. And they, uh, so they start to go after these guys, and they say, we gotta starve these guys out. So they shut down the league, deny them access. That's the first way they live there economic uh, uh, base of uh, and then then they go into uh, uh, go after them uh, through uh, the business practices they, they used to have the Halifax market they go after them to shut down their uh, the market and then they go from there into uh, uh, just start denying them work opportunities then by 1910 this leaves no more the guys are playing out in the ponds in Nova Scotia uh, when they finally start going back in World War One happens these guys end up uh, on the battlefields of uh, France, a lot of these guys. And uh, there's a picture right there. The gentleman with the mustache on the corner there, his name's uh, Lawrence, uh, William Lawrence Paris. He's the goalie on the cover of the book, I tried to go today. He, well, he served over in Europe in the number two construction battalion. But these guys go over to Europe, they fight for four years uh, with the Canadian Expeditionary Force. They come back to Nova Scotia, they walk right into the Depression. The families are basically starved out of uh, Nova Scotia because of the recession and depression that takes place there. A lot of them end up down in the Boston area, uh, these families. 
and they, they, they establish uh, Boston hockey traditions, uh, the second state Boston black uh, hockey traditions. We see, we see evidence of it going back to 1911, but uh, we also see uh, this major influx of black hockey in the Boston region between 1920 and 1935, most, and we can recognize the surnames of those players uh, they're coming out of the parents Edward Island, not Nova Scotia. So we got these families basically started out in Nova Scotia, showing up in, in Massachusetts, becoming railroad porters, a lot of them, and working uh, out of areas like in Minneapolis and out into Winnipeg and other places. And if you follow the railroad lines across North America, you can start to see black hockey teams emerging. By the 1930s, the first professional black hockey team uh, was established by a gentleman by the name of uh, Russell Bolts, uh, or Bolts, I guess is his name. And uh, he was Swedish, and uh, he was uh, he, he was uh, an organizer. He was an organizer, and uh, he uh, he uh, he created the first professional team out of Minneapolis. Okay. Okay. So he uh, he creates the first professional black hockey team and out of Minneapolis, and they don't go anywhere. And they because uh, uh, they can't get anyone to play them, and they disappear. And then a few years later, out of uh, Winnipeg, there's another attempt to create a, a black professional hockey team. Again, using uh, a lot of these families who have hockey traditions go back to the CHL. And again, that we don't know whatever happens. And by the height of the depression, a lot of this stuff is is forgotten. Uh, people move on. You know, we know about the Bird Party. We know about some of these other uh, groups and uh, uh, that you know, followed in the footsteps. But this whole chapter of history just kind of disappears. And uh, in the course of researching this, we just you know, as we research more and more of this, we find out that uh, you know, there's so much more that we, that needs to be. Uh, there's so much more that needs to be. Uh, I'll let me hold this. There's so, there's so much more that needs to be researched because we don't have all the answers. We've been at this now for about 17 years, looking for the story. We think we, we used to think we had uncovered about 30 percent of this history. We we're more realistic now. We think we've uncovered 15 percent of this history because so much is unknown. We know from between 1880. I'll finish up here real quick with a couple of things. Between 1880. In 1900 or 1930, there was 48 different black hockey teams that we've documented in the state that existed. 48, uh, over 400 players. Of that, probably a dozen or two dozen uh, had the skills to play at a professional level or uh, or among the best in the game. There, there's no doubt about it. We can see that from the historical accounts. When we look at uh, uh, 1958, Willie O'Reilly, and I'd like to finish up this. Willie O'Reilly, he uh, entered the NHL playing for the Boston Bruins. Uh, Willie O'Reilly, his his pair, uh, his descendants, uh, his descendant uh, was a, a 16-year-old runaway slave called Paris O'Reilly. Uh, Paris O'Reilly, H-O-R on a Y. O'Reilly was the uh, was a runaway from uh, uh, from the Carolinas, a gentleman by the name of Colonel O'Reilly, or it was French Huguenot family uh, owned him. He had run and he had fought with the Ethiopian regiment. He had fought uh, up to New York. And he, uh, he was evacuated off Governor, Governor's Island with 150 Ethiopian regiment, and they went into uh, New Brunswick. And his, his family were a part of the uh, backbone of the British military that was put on the border between the United States and Canada to protect uh, from the American invasion. And the O'Reilly's settled in the Fredericton area. And by the 1920s, uh, you know, 120 years later, or 20, 130 years later, they were uh, they had, were playing in the leagues uh, in, in around that area. They were quite, uh, uh, you know, amazing in the terms of their, uh, you know, skill. And O'Reilly, born in the 1930s, would eventually make it to the NHL. But O'Reilly, I think there's a, there is some uh, guiding hand in history. O'Reilly uh, played for the Boston Bruins, and he played with the same colors, uh, team colors, uh, as the uniform of uh, the uh, black loyalists that fought for the American Revolution of the Ethiopian Regiment. So there is some justice in history to think back that uh, here this gentleman is. Today we don't, uh, if you go down into the Carolinas, they'll see, you'll see there's an area called uh, 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 Horry County in, uh, I believe it's in uh, South Carolina, or North Carolina, and uh, uh, they celebrate the gentleman as uh, 
as one of the uh, great revolutionaries of uh, of the American Revolution. They don't celebrate the fact he had 360 slaves and six plantations, uh, or they, nor do they recognize the fact that one of the descendants of the runaways who turned out to be the first black man played in the National Hockey League. Uh, history is interesting, history is fascinating, and there's a lot to it, and I think as we, if we can keep our eyes open and look forward, uh, we're, we'll discover a lot about the past and we can reflect on it, we can see how the past shapes who we are today and the significance of it. With that said, I'd like to thank you for having us here today. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, them, because there's a lot uh, we can answer in terms of some of this early history that we can touch on. But uh, again, thank you very much for having us. Okay, uh, before I do the closing, I would like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Hagen to come out from Baker College and make an announcement, please. Well, we've been reminded here today by the Fosties how important history is. It's interesting, but it also shapes our understanding of ourselves and our understanding of the present. And I want to send you forth with an invitation. Just by show of hands, how many of you have had an opportunity to visit the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia at Ferris State University in Big Rapids. How many of you have had a chance to be there? Several of you have been there, and you, those of us who have been there, we can tell you it's, a, it's, an, it's an incredible experience. Uh, many disturbing images, many sobering images. The museum has collected uh, racist artifacts from uh, the Jim Crow era and contemporary uh, items to illustrate the history of racial stereotyping in the United States. Well, next week, we are bringing that exhibit to us. It is going to be at Baker College next week on Monday through Thursday. There's a traveling exhibit of about 39 pieces. Uh, the exhibit will be free and open to the public. It will open at noon on Monday and be open until 6.30. And, we'll, and then, of course, it will be open on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 a.m. until 6.30. I hope you will have a chance to come by and go through it. It is a self-guided tour. I think uh, if you will find it uh, both very, very sobering and also, I think, very a good week to reflect upon that as we remember uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Hope you can join us. to make this very short um, and so I want to thank everyone I want to thank the Foskey brothers for sharing with us a new history and I'm glad to be able to use the words new history because sometimes when I'm telling my wife what happened that's what she says I'm making is new history <laughs> but I'd also like to uh, thank all of our presenters <laughs> I'd like to thank all of our presenters uh, that we had historically come in to speak to the Unity Breakfast because this is this is a really unique event where we can bring people from the community together and remember and commemorate the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the work that he's done and the work that still needs to be done. Okay, and I'd finally like to thank our audience, all of you. There's a lot of people that I see today that I see every year at this event and I see these people throughout the community every year. And I will miss you as I'm uh, going to be leaving the Student Community College, but um, I, I do hope that you guys will continue to carry this on and continue to do this and continue to support the Student Community College, this Unity event, this Unity Breakfast. And with that, I would like to thank you all for coming out and joining us today. Have a great day.